folks, this is Glenn Guy at the Arcana. This presentation is called Photographing Our Three-Dimensional World in Two Dimensions. One of my instructional videos titled Photography, Making Something Out of Nothing, deals with the approach that underlines much of my own photography. It includes lots of interesting information about how you might go about making photographs, particularly when the subject matter or the light is not ideal. One of the topics discussed is lens focal length and I've been asked to further clarify some of the points made concerning the way different lenses record our world. It's important to understand the relationship between the world as we perceive it in three dimensions and the way our camera records it in two dimensions. There is no depth in a photograph, only a perception of depth, which we control via, for example, composition, angle of view, light, colour, perspective and focal length, the cropping factor. On a full frame camera, where the sensor is the same size as a 35mm negative or slide, a 50mm lens is referred to as a standard or normal lens because it displays a field of view that we might consider normal. When it comes to the vastly more common, which many of you might like to call popular, cameras with APS-C size sensors, this changes. As these sensors are physically smaller than full frame sensors, a significantly smaller amount of the scene is projected through the lens and recorded on the sensor. Fortunately, your viewfinder only shows you what is actually being recorded, more or less. The angle of view projected by the lens doesn't change between full frame and APS-C sensor cameras. But how much of that scene is projected onto and therefore recorded by the sensor does? When it comes to determining the angle of view for cameras with sensors that are physically smaller than those in full frame cameras, the actual focal length of the lens, for example 50mm, is no longer important. What matters is the effective focal length. That's because the effective focal length relates directly to your camera and the photos you make with that lens. As of August 2014, Canon's range of full frame cameras includes the EOS 6D, 5D Mark III, and the 1DX. Nikon's range of full frame cameras includes the D4, D610, D800, and D800E, as well as the DF. Sony's range of full frame cameras includes the Alpha SLT. A99, the Alpha A7, A7R and A7S mirrorless cameras and the DCS RX1 fixed lens mirrorless camera. Lycus range of full frame cameras includes the M for Mary, M monochrome, ME and M-P. As the manufacturing costs for full frame sensors decreases over time, we can expect to see more full-frame cameras on the market at more reasonable prices. Effective focal length. To determine the effective focal length of a Nikon APS-C camera, simply multiply the actual focal length of the lens, for example 100mm, by 1.5, which is the cropping factor. It's the same as adding 50%. You need to do this because the size of the sensor in Nikon APS-C cameras is about two-thirds on a diagonal measurement that of a sensor in a full-frame Nikon camera. So for example, a Nikon 50mm lens, when multiplied by the cropping factor of 1.5, becomes an effective focal length of 75mm on a Nikon APS-C camera. Likewise, a 100mm lens would become a 150mm effective focal length and a 200mm lens would become 300mm effective focal length on a Nikon APS-C camera. As Canon APS-C sensors are slightly smaller than their Nikon counterparts, you determine the effective focal length of a Canon APS-C camera by multiplying the actual focal length of the lens, for example 100mm, by 1.6. Here are some examples. A 50mm Canon lens on a Canon APS-C sensor camera would have an effective focal length of 80mm. A 100mm lens 
would have an effective focal length of 160 millimeters, and a 200 millimeter Canon lens would have an effective focal length on a Canon APS-C sensor camera of 320 millimeter. To understand what the cropping factor associated with your own camera is, you could check online or alternatively go to your camera's instruction manual and under the specifications page, you should see it listed under cropping factor. In some cases, it'll be listed under the term magnification factor, which is actually erroneous. By the way, the term magnification factor is often erroneously used in relation to the relatively smaller canvas of the APS-C size sensors compared to their full frame counterparts. The fact that your subject appears closer and larger in the frame within an APS-C sensor camera is not due to any optical properties associated with greater magnification of the lens. It's simply because of the reduced amount of the scene that is actually being projected and recorded onto the sensor. It's therefore more accurate to say that the scene has been cropped, thus the term cropping factor. The fact that the subject is recorded larger on the sensor is the reason why APS-C cameras are often considered better choices for sports, wildlife, paparazzi and surveillance photography. And because the sensor is smaller, the mirror, pentaprism and the chassis that's built around the sensor in a DSLR camera is also smaller and lighter. That reduces significantly manufacturing costs and those costs are passed on to the consumer. What's more, the cropping factor means that, for example, a 400mm focal length will now produce an image at least in relation to the size of the subject in the frame comparable to a 600mm lens on a full frame camera. The associated reduction in cost, size and weight can be extremely beneficial for photographers working at such powerful focal lengths. But the goddess of photography tends to give with one hand and then take with the other. While in many ways you win with APS-C cameras when it comes to telephoto photography, you must, therefore, lose when it comes to wide-angle photography. This is why landscape and architectural photographers often prefer full-frame sensor cameras where, for example, a 24mm focal length remains 24mm. While you gain no advantage in apparent magnification with longer focal lengths on full-frame cameras, importantly, none of the scene is cropped off by the sensor. And that's where you win big time with the wider angle focal lengths. The photos in this presentation were made of the Canon 5D, Canon 5D Mark II and Nikon D800E cameras. So over the years I've had three full frame digital cameras. I held off purchasing my first DSLR camera a few years longer than I would have liked. That's because I was waiting for a full frame camera at what I considered a reasonable price point. As all of the cameras I mentioned are full frame cameras, any focal lengths referred to from this point forward could be considered both actual and effective focal lengths. There's no need to calculate in a cropping factor unless, of course, you were trying to make the same photographs at the same camera to subject distance with a smaller sensor camera. Take this iconic image of a surfer at Bells Beach near Torquay, southeastern Australia. It's made of a 600mm lens. An absolute beast I borrowed for a weekend from Canon, the only time I've ever photographed surfing. If you were standing next to me wanting to achieve the same composition with a Nikon APS-C camera, you could do so with a 400mm focal length. That's because 400mm multiplied by the 1.5 cropping factor becomes 600mm. Simple. However, in the case of this photo of a glorious sunrise, made at Milford Sound on the South Island of New Zealand, I employed a 14mm focal length on my Nikon D800E camera. To make the same image on a Nikon APS-C sensor camera, I would need a lens with a focal length somewhere between 9 and 10mm. Standard lens. A 50mm lens is regarded as a normal or standard lens because it approximates what we see in relation to the field of view seen through the viewfinder and recorded onto the sensor. Wide angle lenses. 
A wide angle lens literally records a wider angle of view, left, right, above and below, compared to that of a normal focal length lens. The potential compromise associated with being able to fit more into the frame with a wide angle lens is that your subject is likely to look smaller and further away. Another characteristic of a wide angle lens is that it appears to exaggerate the sense of space and depth in an image. The wider the lens, the more exaggerated that relationship becomes. A 24mm lens is regarded as a wide angle lens. Actually, when used properly, it's a classic wide angle focal length, providing a visually dynamic rendering of the scene. The secret to using wide angle lenses is, therefore, to ensure your composition includes a visually arresting element. For example, colourful flowers, a person that's close to the camera. They will now be rendered larger than life and there's a really interesting dynamic occurring between them and the more distant mid and background. Telephoto lenses. A telephoto, as in telescopic lens, magnifies a portion of the scene, making the subject appear larger or closer than they actually are. A potential compromise associated with this magnified view is that the subject's surroundings fall outside of the frame and, as a result, are lost. While wide-angle lenses depict the subject within their environment, telephoto lenses tend to isolate the subject from their environment. In the case of a Canon 24-105mm zoom lens employed on a Canon 5D Mark III full-frame camera, focal lengths less than 50mm can be considered wide-angle while focal lengths above 50mm can be considered telephoto. Remember, on an APS-C camera, the 50mm focal length is no longer considered to be a normal lens. It now becomes a portrait lens in the 75 to 80mm range, depending on whether we're talking Canon or Nikon. How to use your zoom lens. The wide angle focal length, such as 24mm, are best employed to emphasise space and depth in your photo. Conversely, the telephoto focal lengths, such as 105mm, produce more of a two-dimensional rendering of the scene. The more powerful the lens, the stronger the effect. You could call that phenomena an impression of compression. It's often evident in sports and wildlife photography, where the distance between the subject and background appears to be less than it actually is. The more powerful the focal length, the more subject and background appear to be squeezed together. Conclusion. It's one thing to have a zoom lens and quite another to be able to use it properly. The lesson, and I believe it's one of critical importance, is not to compose your image by zooming. The correct way to use a zoom lens is to first determine whether you're interested in exploring the space and depth of the scene in question in which case you should choose a wide angle focal length. Alternatively, concentrate the viewer's attention on the subject by isolating it from its surroundings or eliminate space and draw attention to layering that may exist within the scene by choosing the telephoto end of your zoom lens. Once you have set the appropriate focal length, use your legs to move forwards or backwards to achieve the correct framing. Well, there's quite a lot of information in that presentation. I do hope you've enjoyed it, and I look forward to sharing more information with you in the future. Thanks, and bye for now.